So a few years ago, you wrote that the cigarette is the deadliest object in the history of human civilization. Cigarettes kill about six million people every year, a number that will grow before it shrinks. Smoking in the 20th century killed 100 million people, and a billion could perish in our century unless we reverse the course. Can you explain this idea that it's the deadliest object in the history of human civilization? Maybe just also talk about big tobacco and your efforts there. Well, cigarettes have killed more than any other object, than all the world of iron, all the world of gunpowder. Nuclear bombs have only killed a few hundred thousand people. Cigarettes have killed hundreds of millions and every year kill about as many as COVID. They're, they're sort of neck and neck, but if you took the last five years, there's no contest. Cigarettes have killed far more and are far more preventable. So what we're in a world, this bizarro world, where every night there's a COVID report and cigarettes would never be mentioned. Cigarettes would no more likely to be mentioned than if we were talking about chewing gum on a sidewalk. They'd be no more likely to be in a presidential debate than, you know, uh, sneezing in the wrong place. So we live in this world where most things are invisible. You know, we, we are, the eyes are in the front of the head. We don't see what's behind us. We have a fovea, which means not only do we only see what's in front of us, we see in a very narrow tunnel. And that's because we're predators. We don't have the eternal watchfulness of prey. We have a zeroed targeted focus. And that leads to a kind of myopia or a tunnel vision and all kinds of things. Then when you get something like a very powerful tobacco industry, which is a multi, multi-billion dollar industry, which still spends many billions of dollars advertising every year, but nonetheless manages to make themselves invisible. You have this powerful agent that is producing, producing this engine of death that uh, is invisible. It's been reduced to the fish that move themselves. In other words, there's not really a tobacco industry. There's just people who smoke, and that's a personal choice, like what food we're going to have for dinner tonight. And so it's erased from the policy world. It's as if it doesn't exist. And creating that sense of invisibility to failure to understand the causes of causes is what allows the epidemic to continue, but also not even to be acknowledged. How is the invisibility created? Is it natural, is it just human nature that ideas just fade from our attention? Or is it malevolent, still going on kind of um, action by the tobacco companies to I keep this invisible? It's still going on. Uh, even when you see an ad against cigarettes on television, that's dramatically curtailed because the law that made those even possible required that there be there's an anti villainy clause. The industry can't be made in, uh, even visible in those ads. In some, they get away with it, but the uh, industry operates through very powerful agents, you know, powerful senators. Um, they used to count uh, three quarters of the members of, of Congress as, you know, grade A contacts. They had most of the senators in their pocket, a lot of the senators. Sometimes they'll play both sides of the aisle. Basically, tobacco is democratic, Democratic Party until basically the 70s and, and Ronald Reagan, then it shifts over to becoming um, Republican. They create bodies like the Tea Party. They merge with big oil, the Koch brothers in the 1980s and 90s to form the Tea Party and a whole series of, of fronts which fight against all regulation and all taxation in order to prevent gas taxes and cigarette taxes, which are bonded in the convenience store and Walmart. Most cigarettes are actually sold in places like Walmart and uh, pharmacies and, and 7-Elevens, things like that. 
And through that locus, then you have gasoline and tobacco sort of in this micro-architectural collaboration. Uh, so there's multiple, multiple means that they use. Plus a lot of their targeting is, is, is hyper-specific. They use the internet very effectively. They use email and, and th- that are customer, customer targeting. What goes to the mind of a big tobacco executive? This is connecting to our previous conversations of scientists and so on. I always wonder about that. I um, talked to Pfizer CEO, for example, and there's a deep question with the Pfizer CEO. With with I, I guess any CEO, but big pharma. Would you? It's like if you can come up with a cure that gets rid of a, the problem, and that's in the big pharma, would you want to? Because you're going to lose a lot of money once the cure fixes the problem. It's nice to, like, there's so many incentives to make money. Can you think clearly and make the right decisions? I'd like to believe most people are good and. Um, it's almost like this uh, Steve Jobs idea, just like do the right thing and you'll make money in the end. It's like long-term, you'll make a lot of money if you do the right action, because there's always going to be problems you can fix. You can always pivot the company to focus on other things. As long as you're doing the best innovation, the best science, the best development and the, the production and the deployment and stuff, you're going to win. But uh, there's another view where you might, um, that kind of idea of making money pollutes you. It's the widget building. It, it's exciting when you can release a product that makes a lot of money and you start enjoying the charts that say the money is going up and you stop thinking about maybe there's the this, that's the wrong choice for human civilization. Well, one of the reasons I was made a, a courtesy appointment in pulmonary medicine at Stanford was they recognized I was doing more to save lives by trying to stop big tobacco than they were by yanking out yeah. this lung, that lung, you know, on a daily basis. Cause of causes. The cause of causes, which I, which we can keep returning to. Your question about how do people live with themselves is a crucial one. And it's one I've thought about a lot. It's one you think about with, in, in any context of horror, um, how do people live with themselves? How do they get up uh, in the morning? I think there's a lot of incentives. One thing that you have to keep in mind is that whoever becomes CEO of a big tobacco company, they have already made decisions along the way, and they are the remnant of a whole series of aspiring people who want to climb the ladder of success who maybe would refuse something like this. But those don't survive the journey. Those survive the journey who bec- who can make it through, and and I think they have a mixture of ideologies. One, they'll say, "Well, if I didn't do it, someone else would." Mm-hmm. This is kind of the pour the cyclone B down the chimney into Auschwitz. Well, if I didn't do it, someone else would. So, what's really the difference between me doing it and someone else? So, that's one view. Another one is the tobacco industry. I think really doesn't like their customers, except for the fact that they like their their money. When you look at their documents, they talk about tar- targeting against young adults or against women or against uh, uh, homosexuals. There's a whole project Reynolds has called Project Scum, which is Project Subculture Urban Markets, where they're targeting homeless and homosexuals in, in San, San Francisco. So what kind of business model regards their customers as as scum or talks about them uh, as, as, as one famous Reynolds executives, you know, we don't smoke this stuff. We reserve that for the poor, the black, and the stupid. That's a direct quote uh, from one of the Winston models. So it's a company culture that sees the customers almost like as the enemy or like, uh, <laughs> or worthless. Losers. Losers. And, you know, so you have these executives, you know, if we don't do it, someone else will. If people are dumb enough to buy our product, right. let them buy it. Maybe it's a personal choice. Maybe they're libertarians. Maybe they're just, uh, as you said, seduced by the money, and the money is enormous. 
the money is enormous and these these the you know tobacco executives make tens of millions of dollars per year just in their salaries um i so i think there's a, a whole series of of logics some at some point some of the companies have become food producers in the 1980s and 90s philip morris which uh, makes marlboro was the largest food producer in the united states and so they could say well we're producing many products you know, many addictive desirable desirable products. I think one project I'm working on now actually is looking at how the industry maintains morale in their own workforce. And they create a kind of parallel world of prizes and rewards and uh, you know, tobacco queens and tobacco princesses and tobacco sports teams and tobacco. It's this whole separate world, a world within a world. And we all live in bubbles of a sort. Mm -hmm. And so there is this kind of tobacco world where you're with us or you're against us. And I even found evidence that the tobacco industry lies to its own employees. So they censored their own employee information so that everyone would be on board that, well, maybe it doesn't really cause cancer, the evidence is all statistics, can't trust mice experiments because mice are not men. They hire the guy, uh, Daryl Huff, who wrote How to Lie with Statistics, the best-selling statistics book in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. They paid him to write a book called How to Lie About Smoking with Statistics. Now, uh, that was never published uh, when, when sort of word of some other dirty tricks got out. So one way they're able to gain legitimacy, gain normalcy, gain, you know, the, these are supporters of the arts. You know, there are universities named for tobacco executives. You know, we have Duke University, we have the George Weissman School, I, I think is a, a, of Arts and Sciences at, at CUNY. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, prizes. You know, Philip Morris essentially created women's tennis as a spectator sport. Billie Jean King joins the board of directors of Philip Morris. Uh, she signs coupons, the two to one coupons for buying Virginia Slim cigarettes. So the industry is able to acquire this talent and then through a kind of a, an application of causality purely into the individual smoker. If you smoke, you did it to yourself. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, we have nothing to do with it. It's sort of the same argument Exxon is making now with uh, carbon. It's like, well, we just make the gas. We don't burn the gas. Mm -hmm. So really, we're not the problem. It's it's whoever drove here in a, in a car that burned gas. And so there's a very interesting question. How, who, who is liable? Who is responsible for, is the manufacturer just immune because it's a legal product and people make the foolish decision to smoke? Or does the addiction play a role in the liability? So these are all really interesting legal questions and, and philosophical questions. Where do you attribute the success in the fight against big tobacco? So, I mean, there's been a lot of progress made. Maybe two questions. One is that, and two, how much more is to be done? Well, there's been, in my view, not that much progress. To the tobacco industry basically won the war against cigarettes. In the 1950s, the broader assumption inside and outside the industry would be what was that if tobacco is, if cigarettes are ever shown as ca causing cancer, obviously they'll be banned. Mm. The famous slogan in the 50s was if, if spinach were ever shown to cause one tenth the harm of cigarettes, it would be banned overnight. Flash forward, you know, 50 years, we still have uh, 300, uh, uh, we still have 200 some billion cigarettes smoked in the United States every year. Globally, we still have about 6 trillion cigarettes smoked every year. That's 350 million miles of cigarettes smoked every year. That's enough to go to make a continuous chain of cigarettes from the earth to the sun and back with enough left over for several round trips to Mars. But it's much fewer than before. I mean, it, okay, so culturally speaking, I grew up in the Soviet Union. Uh, everybody smoked. Everybody smoked. Well, by everybody, you mean about half. Well, 
by everybody, I mean culturally. So, so what does it feel like when everybody smokes, right? What percentage is that? Right now in the United States, it feels like nobody smokes. Feel, I'm talking about culturally. Do you see uh, famous actors and actresses? Do you see movies? All the time. You do. You can't watch a Hollywood movie without Modern. staying. Pretty, pretty much continuous smoking. But I, just, I mean, look at Peaky Blinders, look at, uh, you know, in, any of the modern series now, it's pretty much a one, nonstop. You're right, there has been a change. I mean, that, that's true. The, the purest metric in the United States is number of cigarettes smoked per year. And that peaks in 1981 at 640 billion cigarettes. Wow. That's declined now to the level it was in 1940, which is about 240 billion cigarettes. Wow. Now, globally, the number has increased. See, but, uh, but the perception, sorry to interrupt, but the, that's interesting. Even in the United States, the numbers, the decrease is not as significant as I thought it is. Because just in my own experience with people, uh, you know, people speak negatively about smoking. Yeah. Well, I, for I, one thing, smokers do. I mean, smokers hate the fact they smoke. Right, right. So this this is the <laughs> interesting observation I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to is, uh, even the smokers are talking negatively about smoking, but yeah. they're still smoking. So even though I'm seeing this shift where smoking is no longer the cool thing, where it's uh, like when, when I was growing up and, and I smoked for a time, it was like a way to bond with strangers, to uh, to yeah, talk bullshit with friends. Share a moment. Share a moment yeah. together. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. And it it's it's interesting because we need to find other ways to share moments. Uh, but you know, you bum, uh, you bum a smoke from a stranger. I mean, that was seen as a good thing. Now- yeah. Did you ever smoke? Mm -hmm. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. For how many years? Uh, two years. So I, I was a music. So what happened is I was a musician. I was in a band. Well, there you go. And the, no, there is a bonding aspect to it. Yeah. And I think I stopped smoking when they uh, banned um, smoking inside bars. Yeah, exactly. Which was, uh, I mean, that was, I mean, looking back now, it seems it's such a powerful move. I mean, maybe you can speak to that because yes, that, that's that, key. Th that was one of the moments that woke me up. Wait a minute. Like um, that was a big shift for me and I'm sure I'm not alone where it's not just, like it forced me to rethink the the effect that smoking has on me. Yes, it, and also to think, can I actually live a life without smoking? Can I? Um, you know, some people have that. I haven't I haven't gone through that process yet, but some people have that with drinking. Yeah, can I have fun without drinking? Um, I think the answer to that is yes, but I'm still drinking. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that that's a big shift. For example, if they ban drinking at certain places. And there's a lot of negative things to, yeah. to say about alcohol. Well, I'm I'm older than you, and I remember when mother and I think you weren't even in the in this country then. But there was something called Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And if you look at movies from the 50s, 60s, even 70s, being drunk was just kind of a funny thing. Yeah, and you would drive drunk. What's the big deal, really? Yeah. And Mothers Against Drunk Driving really denormalized drinking and driving, much, much like seatbelts. When I was a kid, you know, there were no seatbelts. You just lie in the back of the car and you drove out west with your, with your parents and you'd lie flat and it was wonderful. Seatbelts come along and now it's pretty normalized that you buckle up. It's pretty normalized that you don't drink. And so the moment you identify is, is absolutely crucially important. It, a lot of it started in California where there were bans on, on cigarettes. Some of it actually started in the computer industry because some of the early bugs that were found on tapes in the 70s were caused by smoke. And some of the earliest indoor smoking bands were actually in computer rooms, which were supposed to be clean enough that yeah. the tapes wouldn't spin and get caught by some snag of soot. And the workers started saying, wait a minute, if, <laughs> if the smoke can hurt the tapes, can it hurt my lungs as well? And so some of these early laws already in the late 70s, early 80s, pushing it out. It was a huge struggle. The tobacco industry marshaled an army of experts to say that secondhand smoke is an entirely different kind of smoke. It can't hurt you. They, they eventually lost that battle. And now we have so-called smoke-free laws where you can't smoke in most workplaces and most uh, restaurants. And 
That denormalization has been crucial because remember Aristotle says, tell me who you walk with and I'll tell you who you are. And if your friends are smoking, if your friends are doing whatever, it, it makes it easier. The tobacco industry has been a genius at manipulating and really creating the material culture of the modern world. If your shirt has a pocket, that's to fit cigarettes, right? If your car has a has a plug in every car that, that I, I used to have had a had a cigarette lighter. Mm -hmm. It had a, an ashtray. Every plane that I flew when I was a kid, when I was younger anyway, there was smoking on it originally. And then there were ashtrays. And even today, every plane by law has to have ashtrays in the bathrooms because people still smoke in the planes. There's a special technique they have where they go in and light up your cigarette and put your mouth right down in the middle of the toilet and then flush it right at that same moment. And that's why they're- I take a good big puff. Take and a good flush big it. puff and flush it. And to prevent people from bringing down the plane by putting the cigarette out in the trash, every plane must have ashtrays. So that tells you something about the power of addiction, the power of normalcy. And it's related to your question of, this, this crucial moment, if you can no longer smoke in a bar, if you can no longer smoke. And, and by the way, that's different from drinking. Most people who smoke wish they didn't. Most people who drink, that's not true. Most people who drink, they don't wish. There are some addicts, you know, 5% we say. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about 70, 80, 90% of people who smoke cigarettes regularly are, wish they did not. And that's actually where I learned about uh, the idea that we could get rid of cigarettes entirely was just from talking to ordinary smokers. Those are the people who are willing to say, you know, let's let's get let, let's get cigarettes all together, and get rid of them all together, because it's not a recreational drug. It's very different from alcohol. And the genius of of the al of, of the tobacco industry is to turn basic to trivialize addiction into just something we all like. It's addictive. I like it. And also to say that basically smoking is like drinking, which in fact it's not. Alcohol tends to be a recreational drug and cigarettes are more like heroin. So how do we get that 200 billion down closer to zero? Well, the good news, and I know you like good news, and yes, I do, I do I too, news. is that every year we have about 8 billion fewer cigarettes smoked in the United States. So we're going in the right direction. We're going to solve this. You know, there are not every problem you can solve in the world. This is a very solvable problem. It's an enormous problem, arguably as big as COVID in certain respects, much more invisible than COVID, but very solvable and actually will be solved probably because of, of, of climate change, because we're going to need to find ways to reduce carbon footprints across the board. And that's gonna be a, a kind of uh, uh, cultural revolution of sorts. Once we have a category six hurricane and you know, hundreds of thousands of people start dying from the storms that are coming. But we'll be, it's, it's like that metaphor of, you know, there, there, there's a, uh, a sci-fi film from 1950 where they're trying to uh, get back to earth from the moon and uh, they have to jettison their toolbox and their ladder and this and this and this. That's sort of, I think, what the world we're going to be in. We're going to have to jettison a lot of things, and cigarettes will be one of the things we can get rid of.